Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the Lead X Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. How can you find the sweet spot when it comes to personal and organizational purpose? Hello, everyone. Kevin Cruz here. And today we're going to talk about the power of purpose. But first, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter at leadx.org. Each issue has actionable tips you can try right away to advance your career and to fulfill your potential. Visit leadx.org. Our guest today is Chief Envisioner at TELUS, a Canadian telecommunications company. He's the author of Flat Army, which I loved, and his newest book, The Purpose Effect. He's presented at several TED events, and he writes for Forbes, Harvard Business Review, The Huffington Post. Our guest is Dan Pontefract. Welcome, Dan. Kevin, it's my pleasure to be here. So good to hear from you, mate. Yeah, great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk about the purpose effect in just a minute, but I want to start by asking a couple of questions that uh, our listeners are always curious about. And the first is, you know, what do you think about the whole notion of work-life balance? And do you have any tips for those who want to try to achieve it? <laughs> I do. Uh, I think it's crap. And uh, here's why. I don't believe in the term work-life balance. And I think what everyone really should be seeking, if not implementing, Kev, is life-work integration. And, and why I flip it around is, first of all, life needs to come first before work. We live. We don't work first, right? So why do we call it work-life balance? So that sort of throws me off when people say, I need balance in work-life. And the integration word there, well, to me, that's about figuring out your purpose, which we'll talk about later, and finding a way to integrate that in your life and in your work. So that would be the holistic answer, but here's my practical tip for people. I have not taken a meeting on Friday afternoon since 1999. <laughs> <laughs> and so... That's Dan time, Kevin. So for those four or five hours or so, right, on Friday afternoons, it's me. You will not get me in a meeting. Wow. I, I love that. First of all, great practical advice. You know, block off your Fridays for some, some time for yourself. But, uh, Dan, as I knew you would, you, you took me to school because I often think – I also sort of say, hey, don't, don't be focusing on work-life balance – but I nudge them and say, oh, it's more about work-life blend, work-life integration. But I like what you did. It's, it's actually life work. Like, let's get it right from the, mm -hmm. from the start. So that's great. And, Dan, I'm sure, like, you, you are one of my leadership coaches and mentors and go-to guys. But I'm sure there's been a time, maybe earlier in your career, when you failed as a leader yourself. What would you learn from it? Well, first of all, I fail every day, Kevin. I mean, we all do, <laughs> but let's be honest, right? But uh, if there's a particular example, I'll take us back to about the year 2000. And so I was uh, a leader in an institute of technology in Canada called BCIT. It's kind of like MIT of Canada. And so I was running these uh, programs for career changers. You know, you go to this school for a year or two years and you would sort of change your life, whether it's technology, business administration, whatever. So we we're running this one particular program, and it was going splendidly well. Well, people would come out of it as network administrators with a business background. And I took a look at this program because it was going so splendidly well. And I said, well, let's just swap out the network administration technology with web development because, mm. of course, you know, it was the dot-com era. Right. Well, I'll tell you, just by virtue of switching out one technology for another, it was a disaster, a catastrophe. Like there was a revolt. But here's, here's what I learned. So a couple of key points. First of all, you got to try. And even though it was not the result I was hoping for, these people did embark on their careers into the web development space. But it was – if I hadn't have tried, it wouldn't have never happened for these people. The second thing is failure is an option <laughs> because I remember George Bernard Shaw, right? He said, a life spent making mistakes is not only more honorable but more useful than a life spent doing nothing. And so I always remember this instance of this program where it was a disaster, but because I tried and because I failed, I learned, and even so, people prospered. Love it. And I would even add, uh, it, it's a lot more fun when you make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? Exactly. You're, you're doing something right. <laughs> totally. So, 
So Dan, your book is The Purpose Effect, Building Meaning in Yourself, Your Role, and Your Organization. And you call this the sweet spot, you know, the intersection of these three areas, yourself, your role, the organization. So expand on that, because that's really the big idea of the, the book. Most people just think of purpose when it comes to themselves. You're saying, no, there's more to it than that. Yeah. So if you're listening along here, so what I want you to do is to envision a Venn diagram. And a Venn diagram are three circles. There's one at the top. And then there's two at the bottom, and they're all intersecting. That's what a Venn diagram is. And so when I was researching and then thinking about my own life and, and all the time I've spent in the academic world and in the corporate world, it dawned on me that there are a lot of books and a lot of authors out there who aspire or kind of predict or sort of recommend that purpose of self in life is important, and it is. And there weren't a lot of people sort of looking at the integration, there's that word again, right, right. between work and life and purpose. And so as I began to sort of, you know, as we all do peel this onion back a little bit when we're, when we're writing and we're researching and interviewing, it was this Venn diagram that kept popping up in my head and in some of the interviews I was doing. And so at the top of the Venn diagram is what I call personal purpose. So we'll get into that in a second, I hope. And, and then at the bottom, so the other two circles, on the, on the right-hand side is organizational purpose, and on the left-hand side is role purpose. So here's how it works. We all have a life, right? And as I mentioned, life, work, integration. So personal purpose, that's our life. That's the circle at the top. That's what am I going to do to sort of define myself? Uh, who am I going to be in life and at work? So, you know, who am I going to be known as? And how am I going to show up each and every day? So those are the questions, like what am I, who am I, and how am I? So that's the personal side. But see, we all, I think, most of us, right, maybe not Bill Gates, but we got to go to work. we got to make some money. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to go to Vermont for skiing or to L.A. and hanging out on the boulevard, right? <laughs> right. right. So we need to work. So ultimately what's happening is if you're in an organization that is operating with purpose, and we can unravel that a little bit in a second, I found that if that purpose mindset of the organization is in lockstep with how you're defining yourself, what you want to be when you grow up, if you will, and you know the who are you, there's a really good combination there, a good relationship. But that's not enough <laughs> because we all go to work for the organization in which we work for in a role. So, for example, you may be a call center agent, you may be a sales exec, you may be a business analyst, you may be in marketing, but you have a role. And so when there is lockstep between your personal purpose, that's, again, back to who you are, et cetera, the organization, and hopefully it's demonstrating purpose, and in the role that you occupy, if you feel valued, if you feel that you're delivering value, ergo you feel valuable, hopefully you have the purpose mindset in your role. But the best way to unlock this Venn diagram is to say where it goes wrong. So let's go back to role for a second. There's three types of mindsets in your role. You can have the purpose mindset, as we've talked about. That means you're feeling value in your role. The organization's delivering value so you can believe in your organization. So you say good things at the football match, you know, the barbecues, right, et cetera. And you're feeling great at life. So personal purpose is achieved. So there's the sweet spot. That's the definition. But back in your role, you can have two other mindsets because things are going crazy. So first of all, you can have the job mindset. The job mindset is if you are going to work and you're just punching in, punching out. It's a paycheck. You know, this is where you and I get into lots of good work between the disengaged and the not engaged in our right. in our workforces, right? Right. So so if, if it feels like a paycheck, how the heck are you ever going to have fulfillment, i.e. in your personal purpose, and you're certainly not going to trust or feel empowered by the organization. So then you're often, if you're in the job mindset, you are led by career mindset people. So that's the third one. Career mindset people are bullies, Kev. Hmm. So these are the people who are climbing the ladder, who they, they really are playing, if you want to use a football analogy, playing for the name on the back of their jersey right. and not for the crest on the front. And so we know these people. They are the ones who are hierarchical they're, they're uh, hoarding talent. They're, they're looking for more budget. They're looking for uh, you know, more team size. They're, they're only interested in perhaps their own salary and not for their team. Like, there's this equation that I found. The, I guess the sour spot is 
the more career and job mindset people we have in the roles, the more disengaged the organizations are. And thus, over on the right-hand side with the Venn diagram, if the organization's disengaged, it's not acting with purpose. Mm -hmm. And so it's not benefiting society, and it's just in it for profit, or it's just in it for power, or it's just in it for bureaucracy or hierarchy and so forth. So that's kind of how it works. Wow, Dan, that is uh, great. And I'm scribbling notes like crazy. And, you know, listeners, just some of what I was was processing in all of that. Um, this idea of the role purpose to me is is really the new uh, the new meat to chew on in this whole intellectual uh, exercise. Because, again, we're familiar with personal purpose and we talk a lot about you know, organizational values, organizational purpose. And in fact, Dan, I went to a two-day seminar, leadership seminar from Doug Conan, who used to be uh, CEO of Campbell Soup and big engagement guy, one of my leadership heroes. And a lot, the whole thing was about uh, kind of crafting our unique, you know, leadership model. And, and a lot of the participants in the seminar struggled with, they said, all right, well, here's my model and here's what I'm all about. They weren't quite using the word purpose, but it was basically the same thing. Said, mm -hmm. but how do we blend that with the organizational purpose and how does it match? So there was some conversation there and nobody was really talking about the role circle, as you said, in in that Venn diagram. And so help me break it down, Dan, like in, in a real practical example. So let's just say, I don't know, you know, my personal purpose is, is something a little bit more lofty and, and nebulous or abstract, like I want to help people to achieve their full potential. I happen to work at a, let's say a pharmaceutical company. Their, their purpose is to, you know, improve quality and extend life in certain, you know, therapeutic areas. And, and I could easily see how like, all right, my personal purpose is about, you know, helping people, helping people to achieve potential. The, the company I work for is doing good work. I can see that. But let's say I'm, I don't know, uh, a, a drug marketer. Let's say I work in the advertiser, in the marketing department. So that's my role. Walk me through this. Am I thinking about this right? Like personal purpose, organizational purpose, and how should I think about my role there? Precisely, Kevin. If you have figured out who you are, what you are, and how you want to act in this world, so you've got your personal purpose established, if you're working in a far, big pharma company and you feel as though their contributions and the way in which they operate is delivering a value to society, which I call the good deeds, incidentally, and then what you got to do is investigate and analyze your own role now. So if life's good and work's good, i.e. the organization, now start looking specifically at your role. So what are you doing in that role? So are you uh, feeling as though that it's in lockstep with where the organization's going and where you're going in your life? So if you're in uh, – and again, sometimes these are journeys, right? You can't right. Immediately, immediately expect that you're going to be purposeful in your role today. But what's the journey that you're on? If you feel as though – the things that you're doing in a role are far too transactional or hedonic or they feel as though that you feel as though there's no value in it and you don't see the progression, um, then you've got to start analyzing and ask yourself those questions that you asked about your personal purpose in the role. What am I about in this role? How am I feeling in this role? And who am I in this role? So you can have a very engaged, quote, organization and still be in a role where you feel as though you're not contributing. And that may be the team you're in. That may be the dynamics of the role. It could be and often is the boss that's supporting you. Mm. So you got to really almost have an existential look at what is it that I'm doing in this role, even though life kind of feels good and organization feels good. It may not be exactly as such in that role. Now, some people, Kevin, are quite fine treating their role as a job. Hmm. So some people, you know, it's a result. It's an right. outcome, right? It's like, oh, you know what? I understand that I'm required to do what I'm required to do in this role, and it's transactional. But I'm comfortable with that because the organization's doing good in society. And you know what? I take, quote, that paycheck, and I am okay with it in my life because I've got other pursuits and passions outside of work. So for those that are in that predicament or that chosen predicament, totally cool. What I, what I found, however, though, is that those that um, feel purpose in life and purpose at their, in their organization but not in their role, those are the disengaged and the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And again, often, it's about dynamics of the team, the boss, not so much the culture of the org, per se. 
Yeah, and I don't I don't mean to uh, simplify it too much or trivialize it. You know, there is that old statement about you know people joining organizations and leaving a bad boss, and mm -hmm. I I think there are so many of us that that believe what is on the company website or the annual report about all you know their mission and their vision, all the good work they're doing, and and a lot of organizations are doing all of that stuff. But it doesn't mean we're not going to be stuck with one of those career-minded folk who are um, <laughs> going to suck the life out of us uh, in between. That's exactly it. And I'm reminded of a quote actually by David Steindl Rast, and he said, Work and purpose are so closely connected that your work comes to an end once your purpose is achieved. Mm. And so that's that lockstep again, right? Right. So here's here's an example. Salesforce, right? A big CRM company, right? right? Yeah. So Mark Benioff is the CEO and founder of it, and when he um, created the company back in 99, he said three things. He said, A, uh, let's be the first cloud-based CRM company. Okay, pretty good goal, right? Two, let's be the first subscription-based company. Okay, great. So those are two kind of business right. imperatives, if you will, right? But the third thing that Mark said, which they still do today, 18 years later, is as follows. We will donate 1% of our profit to the community, 1% of our time to the community, and 1% of our products to the community, which they call the 1% model. And so in an organization that's created an ethos or a culture or a purpose that is about giving as much as it's about ensuring they have a profit, i.e. to continue to grow, etc., that has created an incredible amount of engagement in that organization. And people who are potentially in roles that they may not exactly feel great about or they're just, you know, it's a job mindset, if you will, because they're so enthused about the company, their engagement scores are in the high 80s. And as you know, it's a quite a profitable company. Yeah, so that's interesting. So, so being really strong in one area can kind of compensate for for weakness in another. That's just it. So, so, so their their orientation program, by the way, Kev. Right. Yeah. So you get your first day at Salesforce. It's you know you go into San Fran and you sort of you know you do your three day thing. But their first day, they send everyone out into the community to volunteer. Wow, that sends the message, right? Exactly. Lead from the top, man. Lead from the top. So on that note, so practically speaking, let's say I've got listeners out there and it's like, say, okay, Dan, this is great. You know, I, I've bought in, but I've got six people on my team. How do I help them, well, first think about the sweet spot, but then find it? Because not everybody, I think, has had this awakening. Not everybody thinks about their personal purpose. Not everybody thinks about alignment, or maybe they do and they don't realize all the good that is in the role or in the company. So how can we take this as leaders to help our team members? Well, the first thing that I always ask uh, of a team is, have you individually, so you as an individual person, have you declared your purpose? Mm. So for example, uh, since 2001, I have been using this, what I call a declaration of purpose, right? So my declared purpose is as follows. We're not here to see through each other. We're here to see each other through. And so that, uh, if you will, is sort of my North Star. That has guided me and the teams I've led as a chief learning officer, as a chief envisioner, uh, as, an, as a family uh, father with Denise and the three goats that we have. Like, <laughs> You know, that's that's my guiding light. So how did you come up with that? I mean, we're going a little bit deeper than I even thought, but like because because you haven't come back. But this is great. So, I mean, that is that is beautiful. That's powerful. How did you come up with that? Well, I took a look at, again, those three questions about my personal purpose, although back in 2001, I wasn't asking myself, what am I? Who am I? And how am I? Right. right. I, I didn't. I wasn't that smart back then. I don't think I'm that smart now. <laughs> <laughs> but but it really is that it, it's about. What do you want to be in this world? Who are you today and who are you striving to become? And how do you want people to know you in all of your interactions? Like, do you open the door for someone? Do you hold the door for someone? Right. You know, do, do you reach out? Do you pay it forward when you're in a restaurant and sort of give 10 bucks to the next table? Right. Like just little things like that. Even when you're leading in a company that in my case is $12.5 billion in revenue, you can do the little things that allow you to help people see through. 
And that's that's I don't know. It's just kind of maybe I'm too Freudian or Soc- Socratic in my thinking and philosophical. I just I believe that if we declare ourselves what it is that we want to be known for, when we're clear about who we are, what we are, and how we're going to show up, it then transcends into the personal, the organizational, and the role purpose. And sure, sure makes I mean it sure makes living so much easier because then we we know what we're supposed to do every day. I mean it's it, it, who who we're supposed to be. We don't have to think it through. Well, and that's why we're um, we're having this this podcast on a on a Tuesday morning and not a Friday afternoon because you wouldn't be able to get me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, I want to go back. So, as a leader, you again, you can help them to declare their purpose, right? Like, and and, and make sure everyone's thinking about it and giving them some guidance to to declare it. And it starts there. Is that right? It does. I mean, it absolutely does. And I think leaders ought to be pushing this in front of their team because, as you've mentioned already quite astutely, individuals sometimes get so caught up in the do more with less, we're so busy, they don't take the time to think about who they are, what they are, and how they are. And if leaders could inject that pause to say, hey, team, have you declared your purpose and, and what are you about? Then the leader knows what each of them are about. And in fact, then the leader can either help develop them or they could help develop that person out of the team to somewhere where they might be more engaged. Love it. Absolutely right. Just could be a, a, a role fit issue. Love it. Exactly. So, Dan, before we wrap up, I like to challenge our listeners to become a little bit better every single day. So what's one specific action or behavior that you want to challenge our listeners? What's something they could try out at work or at home today? Well, um, depending on how your organization is set up, but I would go to your senior leadership team, whether by email, whether it's the open mailbox, whether it's a town hall, whether it's an email to your CEO, and I would ask them if they believe their organization is working and operating with purpose, and if so, how is it demonstrated? Because if you really take a look at what's happening in society, whether you're for profit, public sector, not for profit even, there's a lot of power, a lot of power that's being used and I would say ill-advisedly used in the senior leadership teams of our organizations. So if you ask your senior leaders if it's operating with purpose and how do we demonstrate it, then you get an answer from the top and then you can make a decision. You know, you don't quit right away if it's right. not to your liking. Like build a development plan to either get out of that org or to get another role or whatever the case may be. But that's what I often say is, do you know if your company or your organization, sorry, is operating with purpose? Love it. Make sure you can see it. Make sure you can see it. How do they demonstrate it? Dan, what's the best way our listeners can find out more about you and your books? Well, first, I encourage people to donate to their local food charity because uh, a lot of people out there that are in need of food. And uh, secondly, if you do happen to browse the internet every now and then, I hear it sticking around, Kev. Uh, <laughs> www.danpontifrac.com is probably the easiest way. Excellent. All right, friends, you've just been mentored by leadership expert Dan Pontifrac. Check out his books on Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. You can get links and show notes from this interview over at leadx.org. And a quick favor, if you've gotten just one new idea from this show, take a minute and leave a one-sentence honest review over on iTunes or Stitcher, because the more reviews a podcast gets, the more likely it is that it will be showed off to new people. Until next time, my friends, remember, you don't need a title to be a leader. It's not about power or authority. Leadership is influence. How are you going to lead today? <laughs>